Next up on the number one T. Well, hello, and welcome back to your weekly digital tea time. My name is Tori Totless, and this podcast is all about women's golf. We go, we dive into women's golf every week, every Monday and Thursday. And today I am so honored to have the Vision 54 ladies with us, Pia Nielsen and Lynn Marriott. Hi, ladies. Hi, Tori. Thank you so much for being here today. Yeah, well, thanks for having us. Yeah. Um, so I wanted to get into the book, Every Shot Must Have a Purpose. That's actually the book that our book club is reading for the month of February. It's a great read. And just like all your books, you know, be a player, the game before the game, play your best golf now, and then every shot has a purpose. They're easy reads. And especially if you are an avid golfer and you love the sport, no matter what your level it's just a nice, easy read, and there's there's so much to learn from it. So, what? How did the whole process start with Vision Fifty Four? <laughs> yeah, that's a great question. Yep, yeah, and it's you know it's uh, we we first had a separate journey. I was uh, played on tour, and then I just happened to come into coaching because I'm from Sweden, and they asked me to help out with players there. So, for me, it started so much because. I've always been an avid reader and student, and I I just realized that, and I'm good, but I'm not as good as I wanted to be because things change when I go on the golf course. So even though I'm good with my great teachers, things are happening. And I just, and then I started coaching. I just observed players much more what happens when they play on the golf course. And it became clear there's so many more things than technique and fitness and course management to learn to play better golf. So I was on this journey, and then I kept running into Lynn a lot uh, during educations here in the U.S. Yeah, and and, then, and yeah, and we played college golf at the same time. Um, Pia was a better player than I was. She went on to play the LPGA Tour, and I, I joined the golf industry. I became a golf teacher, golf a PGA member and an LPGA member. And traditionally, um, our education is about learning about the technique part of golf or, you know, helping people make better golf swings or better technique. Um, so that's what I did. And I was good at it. And uh, I was book solid. And this is the truth. Um, I thought my job was to help them have better technique. <laughs> and it never really occurred to me until they would come in and say to me, you know, that was all great, but I'm not playing better or maybe I'm playing worse. <laughs> and they were like, so I started getting curious about this whole thing about how do people actually transfer their skills to the golf course and are they getting actual coaching on the golf course? And there's all these other factors beyond the technique that are going to help them play better golf. Yeah, so it exactly. became really obvious to us. It's it's not for us like, you know, mental skills or all of that. It's actually golf skills, but they're more non-technical golf skills. Yeah. And we just think for any golfer at any level is going to make them play better. And for the future of the game that we understand that the golf fundamentals have technical components and they have more human or non-technical components. And we want that to be the the foundation. So every shot must have a purpose is our, our first book. And and it it came after we started doing coaching in golf schools, not just for the lead players, but for what we call the real golfers. Yes. <laughs> it was ninety nine percent of the golfers on the planet, and we realized this is really helping them play better, even with the swing they have right now. And then we wanted to start writing a book around how we see, you know, our view of golf. Yeah, and. Uh, and of course, as you know, I'll just say about 54. So 54 actually started with Pia in Sweden with the Swedish national teams yeah. and um, and the players. And Annika was the first player you said that really embraced we that. We took it to heart. We, we just wanted to, you know, look more at possibilities and future possibilities and go for those and see yeah. how far it can take us. And why it ended up being 54 is because at that time, these elite players, most of them had made birdies on every hole of the home course. Mm -hmm. So we just started challenging. And if it's going to go towards doing that during the same round, how in the world are you going to do it? What are the things we need to add to what we know today? But the important meaning of the 54 is just looking at anyone's possibilities instead right. of what's lacking or 
limitations, but see, this is possible for me and I want to go towards that. Yeah. And that's why I wanted to say that. So for the listeners and and then, of course, the readers of Every Shot Must Have a Purpose in your book club, um, 54 is a mindset Mm -hmm. and it's a process. And it's so it's so much more than just (laughs) the number 54, (laughs) because many will say, well, I'm never going to shoot 54. And I'm like, well, neither am I. And you know, well, uh, tell the listeners exactly. So the the fifty four component of Vision fifty four is bir- trying to birdie every single hole in an eighteen hole round. Exactly, yes. that's from, from the, a numbers and a performance perspective. Yeah, mm-hmm. but I actually say we shoot fifty four every time we play. We just need to stop after a certain amount of holes. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. But it, yeah, but it's a mindset, and that's what I wanted to say. And and it's a mindset around possibilities and. And golf can be a game that can take people down. Um, and and it's a mindset about staying open to the possibilities and how you do things well. Now, you've worked with a lot of incredible professional golfers. Do professionals and the real golfers, I'll, I'll call them now too, yeah. do they struggle with the same things or are the professionals doing certain things a lot better than the amateurs as far as the, the mindset is concerned? Yeah, the, yeah, yeah, but it's very interesting. So you know, very often at our golf schools, we'll, we'll have a tour player with, you know, 20 handicap golfer or, you know, 70 year old with a, you know, 15 year old. So we, the, even though these skills, all the great players through the history of times have have done these things, Lynn and I have just tried to make them more explicit and trainable and scalable and exercises around things that we know great players have always done. So actually, when they come to the golf school, it's usually it's a new awareness for the tour players and the real higher real golfers. But of course... The, you know, better golfers, they have some sense, maybe more of how to make a decision that they trust. And they might have, you know, a little bit more uh, awareness of some of these things. But but for the most part, they all learn like, wow, that's how the memory works in the brain. So I should pay more attention to how I react to shots, for example. Or Yeah. Yeah. When it comes to the real human side yeah. of things, yeah. you know, obviously a, a professional golfer, has more shots in their bag yeah. and, and options. And so making a decision for them is often reducing all those options to <laughs> what they trust. Mm-hmm. Uh, for a newer golfer, it's, they don't have that many options, you know, <laughs> because they just, yeah, their skill level isn't as developed. <laughs> so, um, but they the, usually but, need to actually well, learn to make one. Yeah. And, <laughs> and I was going to say, but a, regardless yeah. of uh, playing ability, you still have to make a decision and commit to it. Yeah. And never stop. <laughs> Absolutely. Now, one more question before we get into the book, too. What do you think the difference is between the best? Let's just use Arizona as a, as an example, the best amateur golfer in Arizona to a professional golfer. Like, what's the difference between some of the best amateur golfers to a professional golfer? In your mm-hmm. opinion? Well, I mean, it goes back to the things I said earlier, just a little bit with with being able to hit shots and having more shots in their bag. So that's more of a technical uh, difference. Yeah. But I would I, say, no, you go first. well, and I would say just um, a greater awareness, uh, like a professional golfer, for the most part, not always, but for the most part, has a greater awareness of themselves than, let's say, even a high level amateur. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, they've just had maybe more rounds under their belt. They've been in more situations, so they're, they have more, uh, a higher degree of awareness. Yeah, yeah, exactly, because they, like Lynn said, played more, played not just in Arizona, but all over the world. So they they have a greater understanding about all the variability that happens in the game. And, and from that variability, they can quicker manage themselves. Yeah. And and why do you think golf has such high highs and such low lows? Do you think that's normal for every sport? I feel like it's almost unique to golf. Well, but maybe not. Well, well, I I I think you know. Also, it's a higher degree in golf just because we're out there for so many hours, and there's so it's not just like you know hundred meter sprint. There's only so many factors that can happen externally and 
internally. internally. But in the game of golf, for those four, four hours plus, there's so much going on with weather, wind, bounces, other people, along with everything going on inside myself. Mm-hmm. And I, I, we, you know, we do think that it's more up and down than it needs to be because as a golf industry as a whole, we totally ignored coaching the coaching that there's a state as a human, that our body, our minds, our emotions are always changing, but no one has taught us how to manage that, to be aware of that. So we think if I just have the right technique and I hit enough balls, I should be consistent. <laughs> you know, so <laughs> it's, it's, it's exactly. like a myth, a total myth. Yeah, so we try something that is absolutely, totally impossible. So I I think it's, it's we need to have more whole training that is the outer component of the technique and equipment. And there's the inner component as me as a human being. And when we put those together, the highs can stay high, but the lows are not going to be as low. The floor is raised. Yeah. 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 So every shot must have a purpose is broken up into, is it 18 concepts or 16? I don't know why I can't think of. I, know, I don't remember either. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I just read it too. I don't know why I have the number 16 in my head. I want to say 18 concepts. And I, and I picked apart four in particular that I really want to talk about. But I also noticed that you guys, for each of your books, you came out with these action guides for each book. Yeah. And I have to say, I love a workbook. So I really appreciate this. Um, and you can get them on Amazon. But whose idea was it to make a workbook <laughs> for each book last year? Because they that are they be, they're new, right? Be Nielsen. <laughs> <laughs> I knew it had to just be one of you. I knew one of you guys really <clears throat> were in charge yeah. of the action guide. So why did you make them? And I mean, I'm sure they're a hit, especially with women, I bet, because I don't know, it seems like to me, women love a journal, they love a workbook, they like to feel things, you know. So right. how are those been doing? Yeah, but thank you for saying all that. But it's true. And I think Lynn and I both like those kind of things. And we shop a lot of books and, <laughs> and all of that. And we started thinking because we want to go more and more that, you know, it's great if they can come and see us and attend something. But we want to share globally and make more ways available through book or action guides or remote training. So there shouldn't be any reason for anyone who wants to learn more than technical uh, golf skills to to do it so with that and with our books and many like them and we had talked about the journal and then we had actually a student of ours said i have a book, book series circle can i start putting together what a study guide could look like mm-hmm. so she gave us the idea and then we call it action guide because it kind of a mixture of study guide and journal <laughs> so it, it was from us and we from a student starting doing it yeah. And then we only had it for like, you know, one of the books. And then why would why don't we have it for all the books? <laughs> you know, so <laughs> so that's how it worked. And with all these things, you know, it, it's usually I initiate the project and then Lynn is very creative and helps make it even better. So but mm-hmm. yeah. thank you for that. I love it. I love and, it. And the COVID break helped. Yeah, COVID yeah, break for having yeah, time to great do. time to, <laughs> to make it all happen. Yeah. So yeah. And it's probably how you two work together, too. There's the creative, and then there's the task-oriented partner, I would imagine. Yes, yeah. exactly. It's, it's excellent. Okay, so getting into the book, uh, the four concepts that I want to talk about is, uh, I'm just going to read them each off, and then we'll start with the first one. But the first one is, think small, play big, and then anger makes us stupid, make practice real, and then make pressure your friend. So let's start with think small, play big. And at the beginning of this chapter, you use there were two quotes in the book that really hit home for me. And and the quote in this one, I I really I really loved. And it is only those who risk going too far can possibly find out how far one can go. And I just think that hits home, especially for this sport in particular. So let's talk about it. What do you mean when you say think small, play big? Well, you know, with the with the play big, of course, it has to do with this, you know, the creating the biggest vision. If anything was possible, what do I really want? And the 54 is towards that. We know, we don't know which century someone is going to shoot 54, but it doesn't matter to us. It's just seeing we have these human capacities and possibilities and 
if I start climbing there, it might take me a lot further than I ever knew. So we, because many say, well, you shouldn't do that. It's not realistic and all of that. But we have never seen it like that, that mm-hmm. if we actually dare to dream and uh, go for it. Well, and, and imagine. And imagine and all of that. And then the, the second step is to make it then small. What are actionable things under my control, steps I can take? And, and and many have gone, for example, goal setting. They've learned to, I should set a goal, like I should have a single digit handicap or I should, you know, have a padding average. But we found that the bigger vision and then come down to what is controllable has been a better way for most scoffers. Yeah. And and I, I'll put it this way. The, the, the dream has to be big. It needs to be compelling. You know, it's kind of the energy of the whole thing. So yeah. like this, I mean, be audacious to set a goal or set a vision about yourself as a golfer, you know, towards something that really is compelling, not pressure. It's compelling. <laughs> like I'm excited to go after this thing. Yeah. But then, so that has a lot of energy in it, but then it needs to come down to what are you going to do? Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. and you know, how are you going to show up and actually be accountable to this in in these smaller goals. So we've actually done the same with our whole company. We've never we have never set any traditional goals whatsoever. We just we have this vision for the game. And then we keep taking action towards that. And we never knew what's going to happen or whatever, but we keep taking action. <laughs> yes. I actually have a similar feeling about my company too. Like I, I don't really know where this is going, but I'm going to keep showing up. I'm going to keep doing these small tasks and we'll see where it goes. And I'll tell you, uh, three years ago when when I started this, uh, I didn't realize I'd even be right here today. So uh, that's that's so so great. Yeah. Yeah. So you also talk about things we can control and things we can't control on the golf course in this chapter. How do those how does that fit with the think small, play big concept? Well, it's it's in it's so huge for every golfer <laughs> on the planet because yeah you know when we got in the golf course, many care you know they care about how they're gonna score, how they're gonna do the match, or only how are they gonna do on that one hole. It's all about the outcome, which is great. We want a good outcome, but the only way to get the good outcome is to know. Do you know what? If I really see the ball flight before stepping into the shot and if I hold my finish and if I have those small things that are under my control I'm more likely to get the ball in the hole Mm -hmm. so it's incredibly incredibly important for the game of golf to learn to come back to actions I can take for every shot that that fit me and help me along and it's missing from most golfers. Yeah. I mean, <clears throat> when we we do an exercise in the golf school about what is that completely 100% under your control and what is not under your con- control and then like what things can you influence. But it's it's really I mean, an epiphany for some to go, "Oh, you mean I can't control my swing?" <laughs> Or I can't control my score, or I can't control those people that I play with. <laughs> you know, I know it just can't. Yeah. <laughs> and then to give up that energy and put your energy into something that is a hundred percent under your control, which, like as we talked about, like a decision. <laughs> mm-hmm. You know, you don't know if you're going to make the right decision on every shot, but you still like it's under your control to make one. Yeah. And then 100% commit to it. So we, we, you know, so we asked our golfers after they realized that that the board before they play, they pick a playing focus, something they're going to focus on that's under their control. And if they do it, they know it helps the golf game. Or Lynn likes to call it the playing promises. Yeah, yeah. You know, just because it's got a little more emotion to it. But (laughs) you know, you're going to set this promise before the round. I promise myself I'm going to do this no matter what, (laughs) and then come off the golf course and say I kept that promise. Yeah, yeah. Why do golfers tend to reach for excuses, do you think? Like, uh, I hit that bad shot, and it's because of X, Y, and Z. Like, why does that, do you think that's just, like, makes us feel better? Uh, like, why does playing a poor round of golf or what we think is a poor round make our attitude or, you know, why does it sometimes spoil the day, you think? <laughs> why does it, why, why do we get in a dark place? Sorry, well, I, had to go I, there. I think I think a whole culture, and it's not just in golf, but it's it's set up a lot that 
you know, we be become identified with our performance. Yeah. Well, yeah. I am a birdie. Oh, no, I'm a double bogey. You know, oh, my God. You know, I mean, yeah. I remember way long time ago, it was a junior clinic. This was 30 plus years ago. And I asked this group of juniors, like, how many of you think you're your golf score? And maybe out of 100 kids that day, like 95 of them raised their hand. Yeah. That they felt their self worth was tied to this golf score, you know. So, like Pia said, I mean, it's very cultural that we identify with our accomplishments to a point where, you know, oh, you know, I am this golf score, but we're not. But then, you know, what other people think of me is a big deal for you know most of us. And then, you know, it's easy to say, yeah, but you know, whatever, have some excuse. Is <laughs> mm -hmm. I, I think we're doing for protect ourselves because we still need the approval of others or we feel identified by our, our performance that's perfect yeah, yeah. i mean just saying that is we identify it's, really, it's, with you know, it's, it's sometimes it's good training like if someone you know plays in a tournament and you know friends ask you you know how was it today and you know depending on your handicap level but let's say i'm a 10 handicap golfer and i didn't have a good day there i can just say well i I had 98 strokes today and not say anything else and walk away. It's really hard. Yeah. Yeah. And that condition. <laughs> I mean, to explain yeah. yourself. Like, right. you feel the need to have yeah, to explain said, oh, you know, what? I didn't sleep so good last night. So, you know, it was really hard. And, you know, it wasn't that good. And blah, 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 blah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. That's it's, a good point. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, okay, so let's get into the next concept that I want to talk about. Anger makes us stupid. So again, we're out on the golf course, things are not going our way for whatever reason. And you know, you could start to get angry. Why does that make us stupid? <laughs> well, it's actually based on a little bit of neuroscience. Mm -hmm. And when we wrote the book, it was kind of fun, because we had just been introduced to some of this new neuroscience is that when we have, you know, negative emotions and they lean towards more um, amplified negative emotions like anger. Actually, what happens is there's a place in the brain that gets affected and it's called, there's a really fancy word for it. It's called cortical inhibition. <laughs> so all that means is that your core, your prefrontal cortex gets inhibited. It means it doesn't work. You don't have access to it. it and it's kind of what happens with <laughs> test anxiety or road, road rage. rage. People do really stupid stuff because mm -hmm. they only in fight and flight. Yeah. And so now you're in this place where you can't access perspective and you actually can access coordination, coordination or visual acuity. And, you know, and unfortunately, people say some really not so good things under that state. Mm -hmm. And later when they, now have cortical facilitation and we actually have you know access they go i should never have said that yeah but at yeah. the time they were kind of made stupid by yeah. this emotional spiral so yeah. in golf the ones that build up their frustration and <clears throat> anxiety and anger they can feel like you know what my swing is cooked. I can't access anything. I can't feel it. Or the putting goes off the planet because they lost. They can't access their feel or mm -hmm. they're hard time making decisions or like Lynn said, make not so good decisions. So we can see that happening. So it's we're all going to get angry or frustrated, but recognize it and then let it pass or shift more towards another emotion that can give me access to what I know. Yeah. And obviously where it becomes really, really important for all level golfers is, you know, after I've hit a shot that I, you know, I realized that also part of this is that if I stay more objective to shots I don't like, the brain doesn't pick it up as much as memory. So it's, it's learning the whole, in the later books, we talk much more about it, but it's learning a process what to do between shots and learning a good process for yourself after a golf shot and you've been sticking your finish and what to do those next 10, 15 seconds. Yeah. yeah. So and, what, sorry, and, and you pretty much just touched on it, but what's your, the best thing, the best advice that you can give to a player that's had a couple bad holes in a row, or maybe they just had a hole where they got a 10 on or a big number, or they had a bad front nine, like how, what's the first couple steps we can take to get out of that cycle? Well, you know, for most is some need to just sprint to the next tee and just get some energy out <laughs> or, you know, and, you know, or, you know, do a few jumping jacks or sometimes physically just get the tension out of the body. Mm -hmm. 
because it often manifests in like tension. So that, or some people just like to take, you know, four or five really deep breaths and because many get so tight and they stop breathing. So it's about getting in a better state and that better state for some like to do it physically, you know, we're, you know, jumping or sprinting a little bit or some like it physically with the breathing. Some just want to go to, I'm just going to get this sense of being at the beach in Hawaii and feel calm and peaceful. <laughs> they do it more emotionally, but you need to switch your state. Yeah. Whether it be physically or mentally or or, emotionally. Or some just like, even, you know, Annika Sorenstein way back, she would like stand on the tea box looking at the ball, counting the dimples. But all was that was not to get the mind to race and worry about things. Just come back and get present and do something. So getting present and getting in this state that you know you have more when you play back good and get yourself back towards that yeah yeah and well i know this wasn't your question but i want to add to it absolutely when you hit a shot that's great good or good enough make sure that you associate with Mm -hmm. those shots and Mm -hmm. take them in and make them a memory Mm -hmm. and really now start to build more of an upward spiral because a lot of people go out on the golf course and they play at neutral or some level of the downward spiral that's interesting. You know, like hesitation to confusion to frustration to anger to I hate golf, <laughs> you know. Um, but we we know that if you start to take in your good shots or good enough shots, like hey, it went down the fairway, it's on green grass. Okay. <laughs> I mean, I'm being a little silly here and facetious, but hey, it's good enough. Yeah. And and you build upon those, you can now start an upward spiral. Mm-hmm. And a lot of golfers don't realize that, that that's under your control yeah. by the way you emotionalize your outcomes. Yeah. Well, that's crazy to think that most golfers are at a neutral or downward spiral state when, you know, there's such thing as a golf bug or, you know, people love this sport, like they yeah. keep coming back, but yet we're on the course and we're not having a good time oh, or what I, I, that's crazy but I, I think you know the the perfect golf shot no matter what handicap <laughs> level you have you know the, the, there's still not that many of them during the round so it's still a game of that you need to be okay with like lynn said it's good enough let's move yeah. on not trying to be perfect because it's not going to happen out there mm-hmm. so it, that's why this mindset about the game is so huge yeah. uh, and and you know and, and with the just to finish off what you asked there after a bad hole or whatever, bad front nine, but it, it is changing the state like I talked about. But then give yourself like one thing that you can commit to that you know is going to help yourself. But instead of like worrying about, am I going to keep on playing badly, blah, 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 like, like something. And it could be as simple as like I'm going to hold my finish for two seconds because I know it always helps me. Mm-hmm. Or I'm doing extra slow tempo swings because I keep it in play. That you have some small task you give yourself to start getting on the upward spiral. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, next up, make practice real. What about practice can people start to do better at? To make Uh, more of a difference in their game. (laughs) (laughs) Or just starting to practice? (laughs) It's a really passionate subject for us. And obviously our second book, The Game Before the Game, was about that. And we've We've written a lot about it. We've spoken a lot about it. And it's still, I'm shocked that it's 2023 and people are still practicing in a very archaic well, way. Well, you know, I think the, the, <laughs> the biggest thing is to learn is like, whatever we practice in golf and life, we get better at, mm-hmm. you know, whatever we practice. But if we think about, um, you know, so if I want to be better at golf, we need to be clear about how golf is played. Is this played with only one try and it's played with you know different shots, different targets. There's a lot of variability to it. So when most golfers go to a driving range and they are scrape and hit golf balls to the same target with the same club with no breaks, it's like they're practicing tennis hoping their volleyball game is going to get better. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it's just a big foundational mismatch between the range culture and the golf course. So we say you need to decide you want to be good at practicing on the range or do you want to be good at playing golf? Yeah. And yeah. then of course you can be on the range, but you actually, you know, treat each ball with more respect and you change clubs and you change target. And it's so it's a it's a different mindset to to start with to make it 
uh, time that's going to have a chance to make you a better golfer. Yeah. Yeah. And like last book, we did everything about, because so many we come across, you know, they say they want to practice, but in reality, they have busy lives and they don't have time to practice. They warm up maybe a little bit and then they play. So we just started adding more things that you can practice while you play, while you play with your group of friends. You just bring exercises out with you on the golf course that is more doable for most people. Yeah. Yeah. I like that. Yeah, and I, yeah. I guess also for me, and I mean, for both of us, is that I see people who do commit time to practice, okay? And they're like, okay, I'm going to go and I'm going to hit X amount of balls, but they still aren't educated enough into how they could use that time more wisely. And they hit a lot of balls. Let's say they hit 108 irons in a row or, no. I mean, no. And then, I, then they go out and play and they don't play better. And that to me is like, oh my gosh, we just got to help them be able to to make this a real deal. So there's there is legitimate transfer to to better performance on the golf course. Mm-hmm. And you guys have well, you mentioned three different types of practice, and I love this: maintenance practice, performance practice, and future practice. Yeah. Yeah. What are the differences between those? Yeah. So, so the maintenance is for everybody to know, just like you do maintenance on. On your car, we do maintenance as humans. We eat food and we sleep and we do maintenance so we're functional. So it's just known for my golf game. Like for me, for example, I know maintenance for me is to check my posture because it has a tendency to get to to upright because I just slip back to that. The maintenance for me is tempo because it can easily get too fast. I know those two things, I'm probably for as long as I play golf till I'm 95, hopefully, need to check on those Often, it's not to improve things. It's just making sure I don't slip back into uh, bad habits. So what I mean, and I'm entirely you? different. I My maintenance center will always be this way as long as I play golf. I get too far away from the ball. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. And it's not that I don't understand it. It's just a tend- <laughs> physical yeah. tendency of mine. Yeah. And then it looks, you know, of course, technical. And the golf swing that shows up when I'm too far away from the ball is not, not mm-hmm. my best. And um also then I'm not tempo so much as I am tight in my hands and I have a lot of body tension so I've got to do things through the round to yeah. to take out that body tension but that's you know I need to practice that and do that kind of maintenance so maintenance should just be a couple of things that I know tendency I need to check up on and then then the the performance practice is make sure that you actually practice more the way the game is played on the course yeah. so you know, maybe, you know, it can be simple. Said, so, you know what, I've been working on my driver, but I'm going to hit like five different drivers and I'm going to imagine being on the first hole and the third hole and I'm going to go through the routine and see how many of those fairways I hit that you you put it into performance. Or you might have nine holes on the putting green and say, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, putt here and actually see how many one or two putts I can have that you bring in the performance aspect, the way golf is played on the course. Or or even to bring in things that bother you. So like if you're a person who doesn't like people talking when you're mm-hmm. when you're swinging, bring them to practice <laughs> and ask them to yak away so you can learn to focus. Yeah. I mean, that would be a part of performance practice. You know, go to that side of the range or on the putting green where they are talking away. So I'm going to mm-hmm. learn to focus anyways. That's yeah. really good. And future practices – the things I'm going to learn now, but it's not going to show up right away. But I need to, you know, maybe do it once or twice a week so I can be good a month from now, two months from now. So like in fitness training, strength training, we know that just because I do bicep curls today, it's not going to maybe have an effect till I keep on doing it a couple of times a week for mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. the next month so many could be learning a new shot like you know what i'm not going to use it yet but i'm learning how to hit this flop shot over a bunker or i'm making a swing change for some or you know it could be like some have a hard time with how they react after shots and they have to stay with that a long time well yeah i mean yeah they might learn anger makes us stupid and they (laughs) learn some of the neuroscience but they don't realize it's actually now a new skill yeah that won't show up you know, consistently yet as a skill or a habit until they put some practice to it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So we often say that that uh, the the future practice you don't give yourself too many of those because yeah. <laughs> they need a little time and for not when you have important tournaments because then you want to more you know do performance practice and maintenance and you know and do things mm-hmm. that you know you do when you play well. So 
is learning to time those things. Yeah. Uh, the, right now we're in Arizona. And so January and February and most of December too is pretty much off season for competing. And so this is when I take my lessons and I'll, I'll get a handful of lessons during this time. And yeah, I'll go to the range. I'll practice, you know, the certain, you know, maybe two or three things that I'm working on. And I kind of give myself grace out on the, on the course and say, okay, maybe that stuff shows up. But if it doesn't, like, I'm not going to concentrate on it on the course yet. But when I'm going out to practice or have the lessons, I will concentrate on it yep. there. And then I just have to have faith that at some point, they'll, it will start to show up on the course, you know, just from past experience too. Yep. So. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's good exactly. separation. Yeah. yeah. What what's your uh, take on short game and full swing as far as practice? Are you, you know, do you try and give it a percentage, like practice your short game 60 percent of the time? Or um, are you just focusing on what you need to work on the most? What's your take on short game first full swing? Well, I mean, there's a you know, general tendency. Golfers practice it too little because it's such a big part of your game. Mm-hmm. So, you know, many need to often start with the putting short game practice before they go to the range because if they start with the range, many don't leave Never because it yes. doesn't feel good enough yet or I don't have it yet. And then, oh, I don't have five minutes left for all the rest mm-hmm. of it. So mm-hmm. so often starting starting there mm-hmm. and it's been for many very important. And, you know, but, you know, some people have just – they're good. They're intuitively good at short game and actually don't need to practice it very much. So, yes. you know, so it all depends on the golfer too. Yeah. That's a good point. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And I guess too, like obviously practicing more of the scoring shots, they're called scoring for a reason. <laughs> and, you know, that would be more of your short game shots. And, mm-hmm. um, and I think at any, let's say you're a new golfer to the game, you're going to, you're going to learn how to score by knowing those skills early on. But if you wait to practice those skills as a new golfer, you know, until you have this long game, I think, I think the game gets really frustrating. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, so I, I mean, frustrating. Golfers that don't know, at least, you know, we say, I mean, do it 50, 50 is a very good starting point and see what happens to your game. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, even telling, saying, start with that first, start with short game first when you go out to practice. I mean, that's the sim- simplest tip ever, but it's so true and yeah. it, it could amount to so much. Okay. So to finish up the practice sector, I just want to talk about the difference between practice and warming up for a round. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. That's a big, uh-huh. because we see so many getting themselves in such a bad state on the range and stressed and worried and you name it. So we, we totally wanted people to realize like warm up is only warm up. The <laughs> only point of warm up is the feeling that your body and swing emotion is warmed up and that you create a confident state. Yeah. Yeah. So all that matters is that I'm ready to go. So we it doesn't matter for us if I if I do jumping jacks and I feel good. That's my warm up. Or <laughs> if I just want to hit, uh, do some stretching, and I hit hit wedges and one driver, and I feel good. Good. So it's being creative, and we usually now give them like options to try to figure out what works what, best for them. Yeah. Yeah, but where where it can go south is you go to warm up and you hit a couple shots that aren't good. You know, you might top a couple or shank a couple or whatever, and then you start to try to fix it. Yeah. (laughs) And then that fixing turns into now I'm trying to, you know, now I'm actually trying to practice and I'm getting myself into a state of high cortisol and frustration. And, you know, um, I'm already in a more diminished state and all I'm trying to do is warm up. And so... So to take outcome out of warm up is a really big deal for many. You so, know, so it really doesn't. Fair. There's no correlation no. between how you hit it in warm up and what's going to happen on the golf course. And every golfer will say that. Have you ever hit it really good in warm up and then it went out on the course and it's gone? And they said, Yeah. <laughs> and they asked, Have you ever had it like not so good in warm up and suddenly comes together on the course? I said, Yeah. <laughs> so exactly. there's no. Correlation. I mean, sometimes we get so nervous, if, even with the tour player, they're striping it on the range. I mean, I get, that's when I get nervous. Because <laughs> we know the expectation levels are like that. Yeah. 
And yeah. if they, it's a very good chance they're going to go on the golf course. It might be good, but it's not that, that good. good. And or start, sustainably that good. <laughs> so the mindset, the warm up is really important. And understand too that this warm up is to check in on my emotional state. It's checking in on my adrenaline. It's knowing, you know, maybe feet together is good for me, or slow tempo swings are good for me. Just finding your rhythm of getting, getting going, getting ready, feeling warmed up, and feeling clear about what you're going to focus on. That's what it's all about. Yeah. I love that. Okay. So the final concept, make pressure your friend. I, this could be my favorite one. Um, so why is this one of the concepts in this book? (laughs) Because it's something that we feel every golfer, every level experience that you see, feel this perceived pressure (laughs) because maybe you're on your way of lowering a handicap or, People are watching you. You're not used to that. Or you're about to win a major championship. It can be any of those, but that perceived. And we all change when that happens. Yeah, exactly. All of us change. And it's super normal. Yeah, something happens. Yeah. Yeah. You know, some start thinking more. Some get tight. Some get so much adrenaline too fast. (laughs) Some start like over-preparing decisions. So we want players to be super curious. So when you are in that pressure place what happens to you because when you know what happens to you you can start doing something about it but thinking like saying oh just pretend this everything is normal just pretend it's all practice that doesn't work (laughs) yeah so it's 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 knowing it's like super normal we don't know player who doesn't have this going on but it's the ones that are honest and aware and can catch themselves yeah i mean we've had this conversation with former number one players in the world. And they're like, I just wish it felt more comfortable. We're like, it's never going to feel comfortable. It's not like it's ever going to be a walk in the park. You know, there's always going to be a certain amount of arousal associated with wanting to perform well. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so, but if you think about it that way, if you frame it more as arousal versus what will people think of me if I lose today or I shoot a high score today? I mean, so in and, and and honestly, some people play better with a certain amount of quote pressure or more yeah. arousal or more adrenaline. Mm-hmm. So for some, they you know they actually need to get into a little bit of like that elevated state. They have a harder time. They, they play start, better in starting that way. the round. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And you use a concert pianist as an example in the book. As far as you ask him, do you still get nervous when you go out and perform in front of people? And he goes. He says something along the lines of, yes, I do, but I now know what that feels like, correct? Yes. Like, I know what that adrenaline and nervousness feels like, and I learned how to basically move forward with that going on. Yeah. So, right. you know, it, exactly. so top player knows exactly. that, you know what, I need to lower my tempo a little bit or club down a little bit because the adrenaline is kicking in, or they know my tendency is to over-prepare, so I just need to keep every decision make it super simple because my tendency is otherwise going to kick in. Yeah. Or, you know, I'm going to show tight, so I'm going to, you know, smile more. And so it's 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 being clear. Now I'm here, I'm feeling it, I'm taking action on something to shift, shift your state. And just out of curiosity, because I know you guys have worked with a lot of incredible female and male golfers. Is there a difference between how females take on that feeling of pressure opposed to men? Do that, or is it all the same? Do do females tend to, or do males tend to embrace the pressure more? Is there is there a gender uh, the, uh, concept to this at all? Well, I think so. Well, like yeah. it, I think, and it's come you know for many thousands of yeah. years, but I think that more of the men that. Maybe kind of, kind of, sometimes can deny that something is different inside of them. So mm-hmm. they just mm-hmm. want, you know. So they need, and I think, you know, general maybe more the women are oversensitive to all the things that change inside of them. So it's like it's both end of the spectrums. <laughs> well, and I bring it up because it's very hard to fill individual women's tournaments, whereas in the men's side. The men's oh. individual tournaments sell out in a heartbeat. Yeah. And why is that? Do women oh. not embrace that pressure as much well, as men? You know, why is it? 
No, actually, it's it way way back when I was head coach in Sweden, and and some of these that study more sociology of people and sports and all of that, and it's kind of in our genes. But it's that you know men from gazillion million years ago bond through competing and hunting, and that's how they create comfort. And through you know way way back in time, the women create that connection through being together and in the connecting cave and, and in the relationships. So, you know, we still have those part of those things in us in humans. So I've always found that women can be equally good at competing. We just have a different journey towards it. And we can more, you know, striving instead of beating other people, it's more striving for excellence and having a team and work together. So it's the more the definition of competition that often needs to change. And you know, some of the most competitive golfers that are good at that we know are have been girls and women that but they've been allowed to develop in a way to find that competitiveness in something that doesn't go against their who they are as humans. Mm-hmm. And it isn't always about beating somebody as it is, I'm going to be my very best today. Yeah. 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 The, the motivation is different. Yeah, I, mean, it's as, I think sometimes the you know, traditional tournament system has been set up more by, by the men and we just need to, you know, I think be more creative with all that. Yeah. yeah. Agreed. Okay, one more story I'd like you guys to talk about, because I don't know why it hit home for me. But in the book, you talk about when Annika, uh, it must have been, uh, she was standing on a tee box, and she was waiting for the green to open. I don't know if it was par three, par four, who knows. But she started her routine, and she had to pull back and restart it because, you know, she was she's so dependent on her routine and she knew she was starting it too early because she couldn't hit the ball yet like it wasn't ready for her to hit so can you tell us uh, like that story I ho- hopefully you remember it but that that time that Annika had to do that yeah I, I do yeah. that and we actually we, we see it very 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 often even to today's players and everybody it's like because if let's say it's part three and you th- you know you think they're done playing but they're not so then you have teed up your ball you starting you know it it you have way too much time to think about the shot. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And there's there's too that you can't achieve that peak performance state that you need if you start preparing way too early. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. it's more, you know, and everybody's different how much time and what they need before the shot. Some need to practice swing, some don't, some do this and that. So so take the tea out, turn it back around, chill, and yeah. uh, give you time. The only time you need it. Yeah. Well, and I want to say, like, I think something that made Annika extraordinary, and and Pia, you can speak about this even more, is that Annika, I mean, when she made a decision, she wanted to fully commit to it no matter what. And if you step into the, you know, you're stepping into your shot and all of a sudden you're like, you're distracted and something's going on and you go ahead and hit it anyways that's called an anyway shot oh yeah. yeah i mean she she did not hit very many anyway shots and that's something anybody could learn to yeah. do yeah. you know and you could learn to practice that skill yeah. yeah um and so i just think she had an extraordinary well, discipline to you know i'm going to commit to my decisions no matter what and you know if that decision process as you're stepping into the ball gets interrupted Let's go yeah. back and start over again. Yeah, because a lot of people don't have that discipline. No, they don't. Yeah. And that it, in and also like before the shot, the most important thing there is, I mean, more than you made a decision about your club and where you're aiming, is getting that internal go signal. Like, yeah. I got it. So yeah. some are preparing too early and they they have the go signal, but then they have to wait another minute. They will they lose it. Right. <laughs> so <Absolutely. laughs> you totally lose it. So. Mm-hmm. So the when they come to the decision making, it's the club, but it's so much to feel like, Ooh, yeah. hey, yeah. it's not a no signal, it's a go signal. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And you can't get to that decision making process if you're not, you know, being confident with your decision if you're not going through the routine that you have formed within your game. Yeah. yeah. So, oh, 
The, Good question. Really, yeah. I really appreciate you coming on. Why don't you tell us about your golf camps that, or excuse me, golf schools that you do? And I know you name them 54 golf. So first of all, why don't you name them Vision 54 golf, golf schools? How did 54 golf well, you know, it's, play? Yeah, well, it's more because, you know, we do a lot of coach training or teacher coach training. And, you know, sometimes we do things outside of golf too. So it was more just to say the 54 golf is purely golf. It's not for coaches, teachers, or, you know, for, for other, Cor- other well, things, Corporate or trainings whatever, and things like know, that, so, or so, for organizations. So we find calling it Vision 54, but sometimes make it cleaner on the website. It's easy to do that way. And our goal with our golf schools, because, you know, we've been based in 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 Phoenix or Scottsdale area for as long as we've had the company, and we travel a lot, but our base is here. And we, we try to be as creative as we can. I mean, first of all, like we said, with books and remote trainings that anyone can do it. But if they come here, I mean, one of our more popular ones locally is we call it 54 Play. You come for for six to nine holes of on-course training. And that's all it is. Yeah, that's it's great. the warm-up and the different themes. And it's, you know, they're going to be for some with people and the coach and training and many love just to keep coming back for whatever afternoons it works to do that. So we're trying to create programs that actually are applicable to golfers. Mm -hmm. And then some want to come for more a half day of training or full day or multi-day golf school. So we, we try to have those different ranges, but I, I super like the ones that are much on the course. Yes. Not many get that help. Yeah. And we've had many, I'll just say, I mean, it's both men and women, but I know recently we had a woman who came. She'd never played golf before, and she's wow. like, straight on the golf course. And <laughs> and Christine, one of our coaches, said, absolutely, that's what we do here. We take you on the golf course, and you're going to learn to play on the golf course. And it was amazing. I mean, she was I mean, super excited that she was like a golfer from the first time out. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, yeah which no, is, you know, and obviously then, you know, she would hit the tee shot and then we might put the ball somewhere else, but she's learning being among golfers. Yeah. Yeah. And not keeping up play or anything, but you actually learn about the game and mm-hmm. get uh, intrinsic motivation. Why? Because every golfer needs to find why they love the game of golf. And mm-hmm. sometimes we feel people have to wait too long to learn too many things before they get to actually play golf. So we want them to find the love of the game earlier because then practice becomes more motivating. Yeah. And I, I, I just want to add one more thing to that. I just so love when someone says, I'm a golfer versus, oh, I'm still a beginner. <laughs> I'm still learning to golf. Like, and, you know, I think women often stay a beginner like way too late, long, I think, or they identify themselves as a beginner for way too long. I'm yeah. like, no, no, you're, you're a player, you're a golfer. Mm-hmm. You know, and you you may play at this level, but like I want you to start identifying yourself as a golfer. Actually, the, it was cool. One of our female participants in the last three the the golf school and the, and the last day, she said, "You know, I just want to say one thing." She said, "You know, I I finally learned the skills how to play the game, not just how to swing." Yeah. And that for us makes us so happy because we yeah. think, but we want that to be possible for anyone. everybody <laughs> absolutely yeah. well and that's the perfect question to end with why do you love the game of golf each of you <laughs> well we call it knowing your spirit of the game that's how we sometimes talk about it and i love the relationships you know playing with other people um and i love the nature yeah. i just I mean you know golf course is just a beautiful yeah setting and you know i i feel because i played golf for so many years so that what i love about it is it has shifted through the decades yeah <laughs> you know from being a competitive golfer and my own excellence and i mean i just love the game because it was there's so many things to learn and it was so challenging and i still think but for, <laughs> for me today is is to is actually exploring all the exercises and things we keep creating yeah, yeah me that's too. really fun for me and then i mean i just love the nature and and just being being in tune with myself, you know, I can't play the same as I did when I was 20, but, you know, how present and where and how can I, I, you know, so it's so important that I feel I can, I go through the challenge myself so I understand the students more. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that's really, 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 really nice to, to do. Yeah. 
Well, again, thank you so much for being on. All the links to the golf schools and the books will be in the show notes. I can't recommend the action guides enough. So wherever you buy the book on Amazon, you'll see the action guides too. I mean, I just, I think that was a brilliant idea. Thank you, ladies, for being on today. Yeah, thank, I you. Let's, thank you. Thank you for having yeah, us. Yeah, let's do it together. Yeah, let's uh, do it. 100%. All right. Thank you. Thank All you right. so much. Thank you.